Hello YouTube, this is Sam Gerrans from quarternight.com. Today is Friday the 16th of April 2021. And if I look a bit blurry-eyed, it's because I am. It's very early here. So, um, I've got a lot of work to do today. But I've had quite a lot of requests to kind of provide a book list or list of favourite books, something like that. I've done something a bit like this before, but I was going to sort of search out my 10 favourite books or 10 books that have uh, influenced me. Um, and I couldn't come up with 10. I'm afraid I've got about 40 of them. So I'm just going to sort of zip through them quite quickly. Now, it doesn't mean that everyone, you know, is sort of, you should read all of these or that I, you know, endorse every single one of these completely. Uh, that's not the case. I mean, we're readers. If you're a reader, you're kind of, you know, you're you're going to a book with, with like a basket and you're, you're selecting parts of it and, and building up your own ideas. It's not, you know, I mean, some of the books that I'm going to uh, list here um are sort of verboten at the moment you're not allowed to read them or if you're evil if you've read them or something like that not all of them and some of them you you know you're going to you, it's quite an eclectic mix um but you know we're grown-ups right i mean you 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 read you read and you decide what you think about the book it's it's so there's no there's a mixture of books here and as with anything you have to you know you have to use your own brain it's just what it comes down to so um I, I expect this is these are wasted words because there'll be you know people in the comment oh you've read this or you you know you must be a that no no not necessarily in fact probably not at all I read all kinds of stuff as you will see and again none of these are sort of carte blanche recommendations you know every single word of this is gospel it's not what I think um, you know Again, we're grown-ups, right? So so this is how it works. So I'm just going to zip through some of these quite quickly um, and say a few words about, about others. And so let's just jump into it. Okay, so the first one, and these, these are not in any particular order. I'm not, I, I've just got a stack of books on my desk. I've got to get through them. This is, I, I used this as part of my last presentation. And as I said there, I haven't read it all because... Most of it I know about, <laughs> to be honest. This is a, 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 if you don't know about what's going on in the world, it's it's worth a, a read, um, mainly to do with symbology in the, uh, in the media, so you can sort of understand how they're affecting your subconscious and all of that. And it's got chapters on things like um, mind control techniques, um, symbolisms, See if we can make this a bit come in. Uh, different, you know, Freemasonry, all this kind of stuff. Um, what they're using in the mass media. Um, mainly, I knew this to be perfectly honest, or knew enough about it, not to care about reading it all again. Um, the the bit that I was interested in was just one particular chapter, and uh, you know. Sometimes that would be the case, you know, a book will just have one one chapter that you that you love, um, or that you that really speaks to you, and, and that's going to be. The, I expect that uh, this won't be the only book. This will be the case with. Now going back to this, um, I'm not going to be listing down below. You know, I've got time to write all these up. You're just going if you want one, you just have to work out how to get one. So that's the first one. Um, next, uh, this is more of a reference book. Um, Arabic for nerds. This guy, uh, Gerald Drivener, or Dribner, he's um, he's a German student of Arabic, and he's done an excellent job in pulling together quite a lot of stuff that you just won't get uh, anywhere else. Um, you need quite a high level for it to be of any use to you, but um, I, if you if you have that level, it, I really recommend him. Now, next one, nineteen eighty four. This is a this is a must read. If you haven't read this, read it and read it slowly. This I don't think this is something you can just kind of skim read. This uh, this this edition is new because I've uh, given away or lost my my other editions. Um, I've read this book I should think I don't know five or six times, and uh, you, you know it's 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 a standard. You, you kind of have to read this one. If I was going to say you know this is a must read, if you haven't read it, read it. So that's that one. And as I'm going to get into going through this, uh, 
I mean, quite a lot of my life is about words. And the, the main character in 1984, Winston Smith, um, if, if you haven't read it, I mean, his job is basically uh, cutting down, the, <laughs> cutting down the, the dictionaries to get rid of as many words as possible, which brings me, I wasn't going to, uh, let's move some of these out of the way. Uh, I wasn't going to do this one next, but seeing as we're there, let's do it. Um, a dictionary. Um, get a dictionary, a paper dictionary. Don't just rely on the internet. Um, this one was, my son bought this when he was living with us when we were in the UK. I don't know when this one was produced. I kind of keep it around because it's sort of, it's a way of keeping him around. Uh, reprinted in, in 1992. Okay, so I would, yeah, I would get hold of a dictionary and, uh, preferably one at least you know this is so 1992 this is almost 30 years old get one that's at least 30 40 years old that that was pr printed before the insanity because they're sanitizing language and they're doing it really fast and um you know they're making words into something that they're actually not uh, it's happening in publishing now where you find that writers and you can generally tell who they're going to be well, i'm talking with stuff which is more modern you know we have the generic he in english you know um if a child goes to school he does this this and this and they'll slip she in there on just on purpose you know it, these people you know birching them on the side of the road it would be too good for them but you know they that, that's what they're doing to the language and that's just one example and they're sanitizing the whole language and making it fit with this agenda so if you're going to get a dictionary, get a reasonably old one. eBay is where you want to go for that. Okay, again, this is in no particular order. Oh, about language. Yes, English. English is, I mean, the English the English speakers of the world have got this idea that they're no good at languages. Uh, generally speaking, they, they don't learn them. I thought about this. I don't think this is really necessarily true. If you speak English, you already speak you know, well, okay, you've got German, which is the kind of the base of the language. You've got Latin, uh, and you've got some quite a lot of Greek, a load of French words, a Frenchified grammar. You're already basically a polyglot. If you speak English, we have more words in English, well, certainly of any language that I know. And um, that's what a lot of people, a lot of learners of English complain about, how many words we have. So learn words. Don't, don't just assume you know what they mean learn them knowing what a word means is is power in in a way it means that people can't get that over you and just just learn words my um, it's it's a lifelong habit my grandmother who knew more words than anybody that i ever knew was always going to the dictionary until you know until she was in her 70s admittedly when she was in her 70s she did she did start arguing with the dictionary but the fact is that she was able to, you know, she built up her stock of words over a lifetime. That's all any of us can do. And we should do it because it just, it enriches your, your reading, it enriches your understanding, it enriches your ability to think. So words are tools and they're being used, you know, against you all the time. So beginning to think about words, what words actually mean is a way of... Um, sort of freeing you from that or being a f s ceasing to be just sort of a, a passive bystander in the in that sort of informational war now the next one's a very different book the magic of thinking big uh by david schwartz now this is a book that i read oh when i was a very young man it, it's it's quite i think it was probably written in about the 1950s something like that and it, it shows um yeah, 59. And, you know, it's the sort of book that people who, that young, a young man should read. If you're going out in the world, you want to do something. Now, when they when they say, you know, think out of the box and to think for yourself and all these sorts of things, they don't really mean it. What they mean is, you know, just, just do what you, you're meant to do, but just do it maybe a bit bigger. But I, I took this part of this, you know, quite seriously. I mean, obviously, it's a self-help book. I read all kinds of stuff, and you'll see as we go through this. Um, 
but you, there are some fundamental questions you have to ask yourself. You know, what is it I want to do? And a book like this, I, I'd say, give it a read. It's it'll help you kind of sort out certain things. And and habits of mind are incredibly important, especially if you've gone through as I did. I mean, I went through not maybe especially, but I went through the British education system, the the comprehensive school system, which was basically a sort of mm, prison camp with copy books so it's you, you if you want to sort of defrag your mind from some of that it, this was a, a very good book to read and to think about next one um there we go marcus aurelius uh marcus aurelius meditations um this this edition is pretty good Marcus Aurelius didn't was as you as you will know was a, you know, a Caesar and he was a ruler of the Roman Empire. Um, he didn't write a book called Meditations. He actually wrote a book addressed to himself. Uh, I think he called it sort of "To Me" or something. He was a philosopher. He was a thinker, and he wrote meditations, things he thought about to keep himself on on the right track. It's uh, uh, you can read it sort of straight through or just sort of. You know, Choose a, choose a bit and think about it for a while. It's, um, it's in, it helps to realise that you know not all rulers are evil. They're, they're genuinely not. And this was a good man. Um, he, he didn't have an awful lot of good to say about Christians. He thought they were hysterical. Uh, uh, hysterical in the sense that, you know, histrionics rather than just hysterically funny. Uh, but it's, it's an interesting read. Um, where are we next? Oh, yes, okay. This, Cider with Rosie, this particular edition is not the edition that I read. I bought this secondhand um, from eBay quite recently because I'd lost my, my edition. It was, no, actually, I think it's just falling apart. This is uh, really a story of Laurie Lee's life, um, his childhood growing up in England, I think around the time of the First World War. And the reason why I recommend this book... Or, and I'm so glad that I have a copy of this book, is because it will show you the world before all the, the insanity started, um, before um, what they call globalization really kind of kicked in, uh, before women were made into, you know, the monsters that they've been made into by, by, by media and so on. It's not, um, it's not a sort of rosy, lensed view of life. It's got some horrific things in it, which I won't tell you about, but it's, some of the most beautiful prose in the modern English language that I can think of. But really, I read it, I've read it for that. I'm sure Laurie Lee, if were he alive today, would, you know, he would he would be left of centre and all of that. But, you know, he grew up in a time when the surrounding sanity was, was so kind of strong that it managed to keep these types of people um, from, from kind of going too insane. It's a lovely book, and and that's why I read it. So, next one. Um, Robinson Crusoe. Again, <laughs> this particular edition is a new edition because I've lost or given away my own edition. This book I have read, I should think, four or five times in my life. Uh, the first time I read it, I, should, I was about 17, and... I thought it was an adventure book. And then I read it again when I was about 22, and I thought it was a book of philosophy. I read it again when I was about 30, and I thought, no, this is this is a book of religion. So <laughs> the reason why I keep this book and, and the reason why I hope to read it again is because it doesn't so much tell me about the book. As, as with all books, it really tells me about me. It's, I take, you take yourself to a book. Um, Again, as many of these books, which I'll be showing you, or some of the books I'll be showing you, people are down on 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 Robinson Crusoe because it doesn't fit into the the modern c cultural, political correct narratives and all the rest of it. It's a fantastic book. And the last um, I think the last couple of chapters could have been left out, but it's an I, I, it has a lot of insights. It has a lot to do with self reliance. Um. Robinson Crusoe is really he, it's it's his errors of his youth that he's then paying for. This is what I think it's about now. 
the errors of his youth that he's paying for, you know, in his adult life. And in a sense, you know, we're all Robinson Crusoe. So especially if you, um, you know, if you stand apart from the crowd, you and you, you know, you have your own goal. You are a form of, you know, a type of Robinson Crusoe. So anyway, I think that's what it's about now. Um, let's get this one, this one out of the way because it's, get this off the desk. It's quite heavy. Um, this is the Bible. It's the companion Bible, and the, I reckon. I mean, you have a Bible by all means, but this one is uh, what's great about this. It's the King James. Here we are. Let's move that down. And the Companion Bible. So it's the King James Authorized Version of 1611, but it's got these structures and critical notes. And it's got tons of critical notes, absolutely tons and tons of them. It's also got at the back some excellent articles. Some of them are just... Now, it doesn't mean you're necessarily going to agree with everything that he's got there. Um, it was edited by a guy called um, E.W. Bullinger. E.W. Bullinger was a very interesting uh, individual. E.W. Bullinger understood about the shape of the earth. He understood all kinds of things. Um, he, and he I, I don't think he wrote all of these articles, but my understanding is that he edited them. There's a, a mine of interesting information there that will, obviously it's got you know a pro-Christian perspective, um, <clears throat> but it's an excellent resource, I, I think. Just briefly. I wasn't going to bring this one in, but I will, seeing as we're on it. I don't think everyone should buy this because it's, it's quite expensive. But as a sort of counterweight to the the Christian sort of perspective, I, I do have these, which is a whole set of um, basically rabbinic... What, this, what the Jews say the Bible means. And it's, it's this particular edition, it's got Hebrew, which I don't read. It's got English, which I do read. Um, and this is Art Scroll. And it's very interesting uh, because, you, you know, the, the Christians, I mean, the Christians are not one group, but Christians have got a whole way they see the Bible. For example, for example, um, in Psalm, oh, Psalm 2, <clears throat> it says, you know, kiss the son lest he be angry and you perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. Well, you know, see, see the sun, here I was talking about, uh, the, uh, they, they have a very particular understanding of that. Or Psalm, uh, Isaiah 53, for example, where it talks about, um, uh, I think it's for Psalm 50, uh, Isaiah 53, that a, a virgin shall give birth and, and you know, he, his name shall be <coughs> Emmanuel and so on. Read what the, the Jewish... Um, rabbis have to say about this and, and what they said it meant or what they say they said they said it meant before Christianity appeared on the scene it's very interesting <clears throat> it's also worth having a, a Dewey Rems um, Bible which is the Catholic Bible just going to that even if you go to Psalm 2 for example where the Protestant Bible will say it's talking about you know, kiss the sun, S-O-N, as in, you know, they say, well, that means Jesus. The Dewey Rims doesn't say that at all. So it's, it's definitely worth having a couple of Bibles around if you want to, you know, check your sources to some extent. Okay, completely different uh, tack here now. This book, Conspiracies Against the Quran by Abdul Wadud. As you can see, this is well-traveled and well-read. Um, this book is, I think, is, is an absolute must. And uh, it's published by, hold on, Basmitolu Islam. Um, I don't know that that address is still current, to be honest with you. I think the chap who published this, Makbul, I think he, he died some years ago, or you know, sort of sold this. This book... Um, well, it is what it says, conspiracies against the Quran. Is it well written? Is it in perfect English? No, it's not. It's written in a sort of, you know, Indian subcontinent kind of English. But the content is absolutely excellent. If you want to understand 
why some part at least of why I'm not interested in the Hadith. This book is quite a lot to do with that. Uh, you can certainly find this online. You can find PDF versions of it. As ever, I say, you know, get the hard copy if you can, because this, not necessarily this book, but a lot of this stuff is going to be going away. Okay, next. Um, Colin Wilson. Colin Wilson's, uh, this particular book is the one I, I like the most. I can't exactly remember why <laughs> off the top of my, off the top of my head. Um, but I do know that I, re I remember that I liked it very much when I read it. Colin Wilson was a he's really a philosopher, a modern philosopher. He grew up in Leicester and from a working class family and became famous in about 1960-something uh, with a book called the, is it the Outsider, I think it is, which he, he was living hand to mouth, sleeping in the park, working in the library, writing by day. And he suddenly became extreme, extremely famous. Um, he wrote an awful lot. Uh, I've read not all of it by any means. I've read about four or five of his books. Um, he has a sort of apostle called Gary Lackman, which we'll get to a bit later on. Um, but this particular book I liked, it's a, a form of existentialism, but it's not complicated. And quite a lot of what he says is common sense. But he, despite the fact he doesn't sort of, he, he's not a, a difficult writer. It doesn't mean that what he's got to say is, is somehow sort of, you know, not valid or not academic. I don't think he went to university, didn't go to university, so he wasn't encumbered with all of that nonsense. Um, he read probably more than any man of his age. Um, certainly worth the read. And he's, he was a very intelligent man. I've got a lot of time for him. Next. Customato. If you don't know who this man is, I'll just tell you now. I'm not saying this particular book you have to read, but what this book is, um, is essentially a book of quotes. Uh, Customato was the man who trained Mike Tyson. And it's you're really reading it for particular quotes. Um, and let's see if I can just find some. When the novice throws punches and nothing happens and his opponent keeps coming at him, the new fighter becomes panicky. Fear is a friend of exceptional people. This really is the, the, the crux of his argument, of his philosophy, that you, fear is your friend. And, you know, this is a war. You have to fight. And of course, you know, you can take these concepts and, and tr transpose them onto, uh, you know, outside of the boxing ring. And uh, understanding that you have to fight through fear. I'm, I'm not saying that this particular edition is what, you know, one you have to get, but educate yourself in who Customato was, at least, and see if you can get some sort of book of his, of, of his quotes, of his thoughts. We're living in an effeminized time where masculinity is being turned into a, some sort of toxic conception. We need men. And 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 Customato was a man, a, a great man in my opinion, and he was a, a molder of men. So that's a good book. Okay, next. This is, as I said, uh, Gary Lackman, who was really the apostle for Colin Wilson, and he wrote Colin Wilson's, well, this is really a biography of Colin Wilson. Um, I, 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 th this is an excellent overview to, to Colin Wilson's work. I don't think I would like Gary Lackman politically you know, he's he's got the libtard there, but he's an, a very good writer, certainly in this book, perhaps not in one or two other things that I looked at of his. Um, I think if you were going to choose one book about Colin Wilson, it would be this one, because it's such a good summary of his life and his work. And it is a great summary, it's no question about it. I'll, I'll leave that there. Okay, next. Um Family, kin, and, kit and city-state, the racial underpinning of ancient Greece and Rome. Now, this is a fascinating book. I, I don't know if you can still get this anywhere. This one's fallen apart. I've, when did I have this? When did I, I read this in 2001. So, um, yes, I, I think it'd be very difficult to get hold of this. 
um, a lot of this kind of information is just being sort of sanitized out of the out of the sort of informational space because it doesn't fit with the agenda. Um, but I, it's I found it very interesting, and certainly the the conception of um, religion. I've read a few books along this line of of, of the. In fact, in the the pre-Roman Empire, so before Rome became, you know, when Rome was still just very sort of small patchwork of, of, of little places before it became like Rome, you know, each family basically had its own religion, and this is where we get things like, for example, carrying the the, the bride over the threshold because the the bride would leave her father's house and therefore his religion and enter into the religion, which would be, you know, related to some extent, but would be almost like a sort of an, a separate, slightly separate cult in the new house, the house of her husband, and he would carry her over the th over the threshold, symbolizing her giving up the, the cult of her own father, of her father, and, and adopting the religion of her husband in her, her husband's house. And to understand you know, that we are built to have affiliations to have connections that, that this is how society was constructed it wasn't all you know just belonging to um you know belonging to the banking system and all the rest of it you know we have a history and it's a good idea to have some understanding of that um yes okay this chap Um, Kamal Salabi, or Solabi, I would imagine it would be, who was Jesus? Um, he's, I'm, I've got a couple of his books here. Uh, he, he was a professor of uh, history, I think, perhaps in the university. I think it was the American University in Lebanon, but I could be wrong about that. He was a, uh, and obviously an Arab, he was an Arabic speaker and an English speaker and a Christian. And he wrote a few books which will not be mainstream and are get, becoming increasingly difficult to get. I got a few. I, I don't, I'm not a sort of Salabiist or Ait or anything like that, but it certainly give you a, a different perspective on who Jesus was. And I've got another book in, in here as well about where the Bible came from. Um, worth a read, definitely. Okay, well, here we are. We're going <laughs> to, people say, oh, no. <laughs> um got a couple of books this book hitler's revolution i was given this book when i was traveling across uh, this is by richard tedor and what it is in essence is a um i'm just trying to think yeah it's as i suppose a presentation of hitler and hitler's ideology from a point of view of somebody who sympathizes to some large extent with that ideology. Now, before people <clears throat> you know, say, Sam Gerens is a Hitlerite or something, I'm not. As I said at the beginning, I read a lot of different stuff, quite a lot of which I don't agree with. I'm, I'm not a Hitlerite because I'm not a socialist. He was a socialist. I'm, I'm personally against socialism in, in all of its forms, it, um, particularly in the forms that are being rammed down our throats at the moment, in the forms of you know, hashtags and uh, sort of alphabet spaghetti um, causes and all the rest of it and the um, uh, almost the deification of victimhood I I'm sick to death of it personally um, however this is book if you'd like to get a different perspective on this on what happened because all we get is propaganda I'm not saying this isn't propaganda but it is a if it is propaganda, it's propaganda from a different point of view, and it's definitely worth the read if you want to sort of broaden your horizons. I, I've got another, I've got, um, well, well, we'll get to it in a minute, but it's an interesting book, and I think uh, I think worth a read. I wouldn't say it was like a, you know, a must read, but, but it's certainly worth a read. This one, if you're studying Arabic, A New Arabic Grammar by Hayward and Nahmed, Certainly, it's it's a standard grammar, um, and who's it published by? Lund Humphreys in London. I, I've I used this. It's it's pretty good. Oh, I don't fall down. Next, this is uh, Gustav Le Bon, The Crowd. These are actually two two books here. There's The Crowd and The Psychology of Revolution. 
if you haven't read The Crowd, I think you should read it. It's a, about how crowds operate, uh, about how people really lose their personality in a crowd. Um, and, you know, this happens in religions. It happens in cults of all kinds. Definitely worth a read. This was written in the 18th century, something like that. It was written in French. And I read it in, uh, oh, it doesn't, 1895. Yes. I read it in Russian the first time, and uh, I think it was actually better in Russian. And I remember it anyway, better in Russian, but I read it in both. Okay, next. Yeah, we'll do those together. Neil Postman. Now, this is a bit dated because of just, you know, the internet hadn't happened at this time. But this one, Amusing Ourselves to Death, is really about how television you know, robs people of their uh, of their personality to some extent and the second one the disappearance of childhood they're a bit they are dated now but i read them when they a long time ago i mean this one's falling apart and um yes so this was this was first amusing ourselves to death was first published in 1985 the disappearance of childhood i think came up yeah no to 1982 I would have thought they would have been published the other way around um, but definitely worth a read okay this one <laughs> the personal MBA and uh, this is by a guy called Josh Kaufman Kaufman I actually haven't read this book but the reason why it's on my list is because I, in the days when Pirate Bay was still a thing, I don't think it is anymore, I certainly don't use it, uh, I downloaded this chap's presentation, he had hours and hours and hours of it, with him and his wife, with him explaining uh, basic business concepts, I don't have a business background, I don't have time to become, you know, to do an MBA or anything, I just wanted to get a smattering, just, you know, just understand the geography. What he did was excellent and, and taught me some key things, one of which I uh, absolutely applied to my uh, the Quran, A Complete Revelation. What he talks about in there, with the, I, the key takeaway for me, was what he calls about the, the first sort of presentable you know, product. I wanted to do something that was perfect and finished, but had I, had I done that, I wouldn't be ready, I, I wouldn't have been able to finish this project. I had to get the Quran, A Complete Revelation done you know, iPhone one, okay, just get it there, get it, you know, into people's hands, get some feedback and work iteratively. And so I had to basically settle for less than perfection, good enough, less than perfection in order then to get to the next stage. And I was just learning concepts from this guy. So whilst my understanding of the business world is, is superficial at best. These presentations, I was just listening to them on making breakfast and stuff like that, really helped me. And, and, I, and I took some key ideas from that and, and, and it sort of shaped how I was thinking. I don't think you really need an MBA. You're going to go into business. Uh, I, I have actually read a couple of other books. I just, you know, just take books and, and, and you know, make, make it, that's enough. It, it's not maybe enough if you're going to be a specialist, but it's enough to get the, the lie of the land. Why I bought this book is because I felt, uh, I came across this chap later on and he thought, you know what, I owe him one. I, I, this, I took this work, I really do owe him. So I bought the book, I know all the material inside it, but I bought it as a way of sort of saying thank you to him for the, what he did, which was really, which was really useful. Next, uh, Nietzsche, thus spoke Zarathustra. This is old. I read this. When did I first read this? 19, uh, 1996. Um, as with any of these books, you know, you're really, you know, you, ha you have to take your basket to the book. And with Nietzsche... If you watch my channel, you will have understood by now that I'm I'm not a socialist by any means. I I don't personally believe in the you know the mass man. 
this is this isn't these aren't the people who, who who make a difference in the world. It's the individual, and Nietzsche took that concept to and, and blew it out of all out of all proportion. And of course, you know, bad people have taken Nietzsche. Well, bad people will, will do whatever they're going to do. Um, I really like this book. I haven't read it recently. I have read it since 1996, but I haven't read it recently. But I remember you know, this book, if, when I have read it, I think it, it really challenges you. If you want to, you know, if you want to be a mountain climber in life and reach the peak of what you're doing, then this is a book that you should read. This book is uh, Epictetus and belongs to my, this particular edition belongs to my grandfather. Um, I really got to know my grandfather. He, he had a stroke when I was about eight and wasn't really able to speak. Um, I'd already lost my father and so l losing him to any sort of great extent at that age was was a, a very difficult thing but i got to know him as i grew older i mean he died when i was 16 through his books and when he died i took a number of books from from the house and he as as do i he underlined things which 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 spoke to him and i'm a big fan of writing in books he but this book, Epictetus, the Stoics, is a school of thought that I personally kind of adhere to. Um, I mean, we all know the words, you know, Stoic and sto Stoicism and so on. It's not just about sort of stiff upper lip and grinning and bearing it, but it's, it's I suppose it is sobr in, in the Arabic sense. It's that patient persistence. And, uh, you know, being your, not allowing circumstances to colour your experience unduly, I, I think would be a fair summary. But Epictetus, you know, get a, I can't, I don't know, this is just an everyman edition, I'm not sure. But you can find the Discourses of Epictetus. Yeah, you, you can find it, I'm sure Penguin does it or something. Okay, next. <clears throat> Descartes, key philosophical writings. Descartes sort of prom promoted his anti-God. I, I couldn't see it myself. Um, I thought it was a very interesting character. Descartes used to sit in bed. <laughs> he would get up very... He would just basically wake up and just lie in bed and think. And um, most people don't think at all, but Descartes did think. He was a, He was a very interesting character. And I couldn't see that he was this great atheist at all. I, 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 he just seemed to me that he was just reasoned and reasonable. I, I think he was killed off eventually, if I'm not mistaken, by the Queen of uh, the, Queen, the Queen of Sweden, who in, 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 invited him to come and be the sort of philosophy in residence to Sweden. And being Swedish, she got up at like three thirty in the morning or something, and demanded her philosophy lessons. And this, this is it. Literally killed him. He he couldn't take the climate, and he couldn't take the Queen of Sweden, and he couldn't take getting up so early in the morning. And it just threw his whole his whole system out, blew it out of the water, and he died. Literally died. Ah, this one, the call to heresy. I don't think you'll be able to find this, but if you can, good for you. The Prophetic, Charismatic and Mystical in Christian Religion by Robert Van Der Weyer. Who's it published by? Let's see if we can find out. Lamp Press. And it was, it was 1989. And it talks about such people as Arius, uh, Pelagius, uh, Donatus and Origen. I actually studied under this guy. Um, Robert Van der Weyer, when I, he was my economics teacher or economics lecturer at one of my many colleges. If I'd known he was so intelligent, I would have listened more. <laughs> it's um, it's a, a really good book in understanding why people, certain faces don't fit, you know, sort of theologically. He's a Christian. Uh, I mean, his story, and he'll tell everybody, anyone he meets, he'll sort of 
forced you to hear his story. He was a sort of, he's, he's very well spoken, you know, obviously comes from a good family. And he, uh, but you know, in the 60s, whenever it was, he went astray and started smoking copious amounts of cannabis and went off to India. <coughs> and um, while he was in India, he found himself a guru who said, look, young man, really, you, you have your own, your own tradition, go home. You know, follow Jesus, and this this was really the initiating incident in his life, and that's what he did. I think they might have been trying to get rid of him, but <clears throat> anyway, he's he is a Christian. He's he's actually the pastor of, or was when I knew him, of a place called Little Giddings, in in Cambridge. A, a very intelligent man, um, but this is a great book, really good. Okay, no. they're going to come out for me after after this one um okay mein kampf by adolf hitler <laughs> this book is almost got like a you know like a hex on it as it were and uh oh you shouldn't read this shouldn't read that or the other i read i read i'm an intelligent man i can read for myself this book is not of you know it's not all equally written it may well not even have been written by hitler it probably was ghost written some of it's quite dull there are sections which really won't appeal to a modern a modern reader whole parts about the weimar republic and so on but it's i think worth a read it certainly has makes some very valid points and and others which are not but you know is it an evil book you know i don't know but i've read it i wouldn't i'm not saying this is you know on my top 10 list but should read it. I've read, you know, Mao's little red little red book. I read all kinds of stuff. You know, how certain men think, how exceptional men think, how men who made a difference think is worth knowing, I think. Ah. Brings me to another one. Julius Evola. Now, this book, Revolt Against the Modern World, this guy wrote a lot. He was Italian. He wrote a lot. He was a very intelligent man. He wrote an awful lot, and it's only just recently been translated in any sort of in in any quantity into English. He was right wing, but he wasn't. You know, he wasn't. This, the problem is when people are discussing these sorts of people, it gets very cartoonish, um, and and just you know jingoistic and name calling and shaming language and all the rest of it. He was a very intelligent man. This particular book is, is somewhat reminiscent, of, to my mind, of Spengler's Decline of the West. Both are quite tediously written. Um, Spengler's West is almost unreadable today for, for different reasons. This book it kind of assumes that you have an exceptionally good education <laughs> before you start and just takes it takes from, that from there. If you don't... Um, you know, the, you're going to glaze over at, at certain times. I certainly did. But some of his key thoughts are, you know, if you kind of sort through the the flotsam and the jetsam and this and that, he's got some key nuggets that make this book worth reading, in my opinion. Ah, oh, this one. Yes, uh, Saul Alinsky's Rules for Radicals. Uh, this is a, a horrible book. And quite, in fact, quite a few of what I'm, books that I'm showing you, they're not nice. You know, they, they are, they are what they are. This was this guy was a nasty creep. He really was. But it gives you some insights into how they think. But actually, uh, I think this is. I think this is um, a bit of a like a propaganda piece as well. Um, but a lot of people, like a lot of so-called activists, will have read this book, How to Get Things Done by um, basically short-circuiting the system. So that, that's, that's what they read. So it's worth knowing what they read. This book, D.H. Lawrence, D.H. Lawrence, this is Fantasia of the Unconscious and Psychoanalysis of the Unconscious, which sounds really intimidating, doesn't it? But it isn't. This particular book is 
in my opinion, the most interesting thing that D.H. Lawrence wrote, certainly that I've read, and I've read quite a few, a few of his novels. These aren't novels. These are these are essays and uh, about really how people really are, how they tick. And as I think it says on the back that he was, Aldous Huxley said of D.H. Lawrence, he was a clever man as well as a man of genius, a being somehow of another order, more sensitive, more highly conscious, more capable of feeling than even the most gifted of common men. And I think that that's, that's a true assessment of D.H. Lawrence. Um, my grandfather actually knew D.H. Lawrence. He was my grandfather, D.H. Lawrence, told my grandfather when D.H. Lawrence was a, a man and I, my grandfather was a boy, he told him that the war was over. He said, go and tell your father that the war's over. I don't know that they were great friends, but certainly they knew each other or he lived close by at one point. He died quite young, from I think from tuberculosis, if I'm not mistaken. He certainly had to try to get to better climates. This book I read many years ago, 1992, <laughs> first time I read that, and I've read it a couple of times since, but it's it's worth read. Okay, next. Uh, the Bible came from Arabia by Kamal Salabi or Solabi. I'm not sure whether which, what how you say that. Radical reinterpretations of Old Testament geography. I'm not going to try to summarise his thoughts here, but it's it's a fascinating book. It's also being flushed down the the memory hole. It's very hard to get hold of this. I paid way over the odds to get hold of this book. I mean, this was four pounds when it was first made. I think I paid like almost a hundred pounds just to get this book because I could see that it was being being erased. Uh, a friend of mine made a copy on PDF, and I think as of now, at least you can. I, I put that on my website um, under the. I can't remember. If you, it's there somewhere. I've got a page with resources, and you can download the PDF of this, which 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 we made because it's worth this remaining in the public domain. Uh, that's Epictetus, I've already sort of covered him. Ah, okay. Yeah, the Bhagavad Gita. Um, you should definitely read this book, because when people say, I mean, I'm not saying this is the only reason you should read this book, but it is a book of philosophy, and it's, it's actually part of a, a much bigger and entirely unpronounceable book and it's sort of the core philosophy of Hinduism. But apart from its philosophical merits, you should also read it so that you have read it. But also, when people say, "Ah, you know, the Quran is a book of violence," but you know, the Hindus we people of peace. This book, if you don't know, is Lord Sri Krishna advising Arjun to kill all of his relatives in a war. Okay, that's that's the scenario. So just next time when people, you know, take one half a half a verse of the Quran and sling it at you, you know, kill them wherever you find them. Ha ha! This is a book of you know uh, death and war. So have you read Bhagavad Gita? <laughs> because <laughs> the, this is in, <clears throat> entirely the entire philosophical premise of this is that Arjun should fight and kill his relatives on the battlefield, okay? Just just to put it in some perspective. Next. G.K. Chesterton, this book, Heretics. I'm a huge fan of G.K. Chesterton. G.K. Chesterton was an extremely intelligent man. He converted, I think, to Catholicism, to Catholicism. He was friends with Hilaire Belloc, who is a, another guy that I really do like. Anyway, I haven't got any Hilaire Belloc here, but Hilaire Belloc... I like Hilaire Belloc as well. This book, these are essays, really sort of anchored in the time, you know, the time, uh, talking to, addressing particular people like H.G. Wells, um, but George Bertrand Shaw, uh, George Bertrand Shaw, George Bernard Shaw, and some of the arguments have died off now. We won't. It will be a little bit lost to us. Nevertheless, I recommend that you read particularly this book. It's you, you can't not you know it's impossible not to like the guy and to to respect him even if you don't agree with all of his conclusions. And this is really a lot of what I'm saying about a lot of these books. It's not that I you know I agree with perhaps all of the conclusions of any of these books, but that's not why you read books is it i mean if you read them because you want to learn something and you you're taking grist and you know processing it 
You, you, you could do a lot worse than process some GKHS. And... Okay, next. The complete works of Aristotle. This is only half of it. Um, this is the revised Oxford translation. I haven't read all of this book. <laughs> I'll probably never read all of this book, but I wanted to have this book because Aristotle basically was created the, the basis for our logic. I know logic is going out of the window. I'm not talking about abstruse philosophical logic. I mean, obvious logic, logic that this, then this, cause and effect. This might not seem like a huge you know, thing for us today, but it's because we had Aristotle. The original Muslims were, you know, big on Aristotle. Aristotle was wrong about quite a few things, but what he did was he gave us a kind of methodology of taxonomy. A taxonomy is just sort of working out that this this is a subcategory of this and this is a subcategory of that and putting things into categories. I'm sure I'm sure the sort of the libtards would come up with some sort of amateur diagnosis that he was, you know, he had something wrong with him because he was obsessively Sort of categorizing things, but the ability to categorize, the ability to understand the difference between things, the ability, dare I say it, to discriminate is what means, what makes you able to think. Is that that's how, those are the tools, all right? If you don't have those things, all you've got is your feelings, all you've got is gush and hashtags, and you know, you end up with what we've got now. Get a copy of this and keep it and dip into it, and just you know. If we don't, if we can't think, we're children. You see. All right. Next, I have talked about this book before. Ayn Rand, The Fountainhead, is. Uh, <coughs> I've read a couple of Ayn Rand books. I've read Atlas Shrugged as well. But if I was going to choose one, I'd take this one. Ayn Rand was a Jewish, Russian emigre who left. She grew up in uh, Len Leningrad, as it was then. Moved to America. I really like Ayn Rand, and I like her because she, it's she, as with you know Nietzsche, as with much of what I I read or have read, it's about the individual. I, I'm not a collectivist. It's individuals who change things. It's individuals who get things done. It's individuals. It's exceptional individuals that make a difference. It's not groups. I don't care what group you're in. It's not how it works. Okay, Ayn Rand understood that. <laughs> It, it, the, these are the people who produce value and that's what this book I guess essentially is about and, and so is Alex Shrugged to, to some extent really worth a read The Rule of St Benedict which is basically a rule book for how to be a Benedictine monk now Am I saying we should all become Benedictine monks? No, but what I am saying, I think what's interesting, especially for, to people who watch my channel, have an interest in the Quran and so on, and maybe particularly for people who come from a more of an Islamicist background, is you can see that it's within Christianity, it was possible to follow one order or another order. In, and in fact, Islam had this also. It's not, you know, well, how do you pray? You know, it's not that. Well, in, in this order, they pray like this. In this order, they pray like that. And here, here they have matins. And here they have, you know, different kinds of blah, blah, blah. But they're following different paths and without everyone killing each other. Uh, Plato, I would say Plato in general, but certainly this, read this book, you have to read The Republic. If you haven't read The Republic, you don't know how the elite think. They've all read this book and they're all big on Plato. They, they, they believe, they, they've convinced you that there's no caste system, but they don't believe that. They believe in a caste system. And they're right. There is a caste system. There's a natural caste system. People fall into, you know, they're either merchants or they're you know, soldiers. Or you can see that this is the case. People are born into what, what they are. They are what they are. And... I'm all right with that. I don't have a problem with it. But, but you know, we're in, if you're being trained not to think and trained not to see what is, how can you possibly fight a war? You can't. And so this is their manual. I would say well, at least a lot of it. Okay, this one. 
Brave New World. Um, this is a, a new edition. Again, I've uh, all the Suxley, obviously. I've lost or given away the original copy of that, so I had to get another one. You have to read it. This is this is a must read. This is uh, uh, this in combination with 1984. Uh, 1984. Yeah, these are agenda books. Huxley was from an elite family. Um, the Huxleys were a sort of a science and elite science family, and uh, his grandfather, I think, was was known as. Um, Darwin's bulldog. Uh, his brother uh, was a, a luminary in the, I think, in the United Nations. I can't remember exactly off the top of my head, but 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 powerful. This was a, you know, these were key people. Um, but Aldous Huxley actually is a, an extremely good writer. Not all of this is extremely well written. The first fifty pages, you kind of have to grind through those because these are, these are all set ups and it's it's tedious. But the, the the latter half, especially when you get to the, the figure John, it's, it's some of it's extremely well written, I think. But that's not why you read this book. You read this book to understand what's going on today. If you haven't read it, you have to read it. Um, I recommend it. This is The Constellation of Philosophy by Boethius. I read this for the first time uh, just a few months ago. Exceptional. And I, in fact, I made a video about that. I'm not going to go over it all now, but this book was the only book that I know of, at least, that which was translated into the various types of English by two reigning monarchs. King Alfred the Great translated it from Latin into the English of his day, and Queen Elizabeth I also translated it into the English of her day, you know, themselves. I mean, I think Queen Elizabeth's translation is not reckoned to be very good, but, but these people, these monarchs, thought enough of this book to, to do that. Geoffrey Chaucer also translated it into English. Read it. It's, 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 it's a, I, this I definitely recommend. It's, it's on my top ten list. Uh, this book is pretty old. How to Win Arguments, William Rush, William Russia. Uh, I'm not saying it has to be like only this book, but this is a good one to start with, and and there are others. You need to understand how how arguments work, how rhetoric works. The ruling elite they all go to good schools. They go to places like Eton and Harrow. They go to good schools, and they're taught rhetoric. Rhetoric. <clears throat> was a staple, you know, of, of, of the trivium. You had to understand how to talk, how to form an argument, how to understand when you're being when you're being lied to, how to understand when something isn't logical, going back to Aristotle. They get that. You used to get it in comprehensive schools. They're taking it all out. We, we, the comprehensive schools and, and just general education in, in the West is just indoctrination. Now, if you want an education, you have to educate yourself. So, so, so do that. If, if, you don't need, you know, highly abstruse, complex books on on how arguments work. The simpler, the better. This is a good overview. This book, I've got a couple more books of, um, but just look at just look around. Get some, you know, an idiot's guide to arguments. You know how they work. That's what you want. You just do some basic things: straw man arguments, um, begging the question, circular arguments, assumed conclusions. These sorts of things. They just set you up for life. Uh, this is Paul Johnson's A History of Christianity and uh, Penguin. Paul Johnson is a scholar. He's a successful one. That means he has to toe the line on some very particular questions, which he is never going to say anything against because he wants to, he wants to work and he wants to be successful. If you understand that, <coughs> excuse me, you can read this and benefit from it. It's essentially a history of, of, of Europe and obviously some very important things are elided because he's not going to get published if he says those things. I don't think he wants to say those things. He likes, you know, how it is. Nevertheless, it's, an, it's a very interesting book and I recommend it.
This is, uh, I, only, I only have this in Russian. I have only read it in Russian. It's Anna Karenina by Lev Tolstoy. I don't have a lot of novels here. I mean, I've got I've got The Fountainhead, maybe one or two others. The reason why I recommend this is because human archetypes haven't don't really change that much. What was true in, in Tolstoy's time is true now. I read this book about 10, 12 years ago. I have a degree in, Rus in Russian, but when I was doing my degree, my Russian wasn't good enough to read this book. But after living in Russia for 10 years or so, it was good enough to read this book, so I read it. I mean, when I did my degree, I read most of the books in English. I, you know, We read some in Russian, but chiefly in English. One winter, I, I, I don't, I can't remember why, but it was, you know, it was snowing, couldn't go out, blah blah. I just went to bed for a few days and just read this, and really enjoyed it. And it, it makes you, you cry from laughter, perhaps because I'm, I know Russia so well. You can just see the same characters. It's it, you know, Tolstoy was a psychologist, but he was also a humorist. And people don't really kind of understand. They think it's all very highbrow. It's not highbrow. It's just a it's just a rip roaring read. Okay, next. Who wrote the New Testament by Burton Mack, the making of the Christian myth? Um, actually, who published that? Harper Collins. I'm not putting this out here to be nasty to Christians or anything, but you really do need to understand. You know, if you wanted to engage with them something about their textual problems um you know we you don't have to be a scholar in it but it's not just about problems it's just understanding how things really are um i thought this was a very good book and uh again i don't agree with all of it but wh wh why would you you know why would you read a book that you agree with every single thing in it you know wh where would you learn okay next Uh, Murder by Injection, yes. Uh, really, Eustace Mullins. Eustace Mullins produced quite a lot of stuff, some of which I don't agree with at all, but it's worth having a copy. I have about eight or ten of his books, and uh, they're a good, quite passionate, not highly erudite <laughs> overview, but they sort of brings in some, some, some uh, nuggets which are, are worth having. Eustace Mullins... <coughs> Um, I suppose you know he was he was persecuted to some extent, and he was certainly a conspiracy theorist. But he was um, an intelligent man, and I think a very sincere one. He's dead now. Oh, here we go. Okay, this one. Um, this is the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, and uh, I don't know who publishes that. I first read this when I was about twenty, I think. I was physically ill for three days. Physically ill. It literally made me ill. And uh, because that was part of the beginning of my paradigm shift. Now, obviously, anybody who's read this book, again, like with Mein Kampf or whatever it is, you're just, you're just evil. You know, the book is evil. You're evil. Everyone's evil. It's name calling and shaming language. It's the standard um, socialist approach. Obviously, people say, well, you know, this is a forgery or something. Okay, let's let's assume that it is. What is beyond doubt is that the agenda that it lays out in broad terms, and this was written, I know for a fact, uh, prior to the First World War, um, has that agenda has been carried out. So I'm not interested in whether it's the Jewish peril or so, so on and so forth. I, I'm, I'm not primarily interested in that. Um, to get some idea of, you know, what, let's assume there are Jews at the top of this, you know, what they're doing to their own people in Israel right now <laughs> is, uh, you know, it should be an, an education with, with, you know, they've made, a, they've made a, a prison for these people. So the idea, just excuse me a second, the idea that, you know, all, all Jews are evil, that isn't, you know, that isn't what I think, it isn't, um, I don't think it's even what Hitler thought. It's, but, you know, we live in a world where now everything's sort of um, made into almost like a cartoon. You should read this book. Why? Because it will show you that there is an agenda. And in broad strokes, that agenda is being followed. So 
when I was at university, at, in, in, in Birmingham University, Birmingham University happens to have the largest, second largest library in the United Kingdom. And when I first went to Russia, I learned these things. I went back to the UK, I went to the, the library and uh, looked it up. It, does it exist? Yeah, there's a copy. I thought, great, go and check it out. But you can't check it out. There was a special room in the university called, I think it was called the Hogarth Library. I mean, it would be as big as like a town library, but it was just one room in this in this huge place. It wouldn't let you take it out, but you had to leave your library card. And library card in, in, in the university I was in, at least, was like your ID. You know, it's like leaving your passport. You had to leave it on the desk. You were allowed to take the book. You were allowed to read the book. You couldn't photocopy it. You couldn't write in it. You could read it and make your own notes. And that's, I read the whole thing. So I have held in my hands an original copy of that book. This is, you know, that was printed, I think it was 1895, if I'm not mistaken. If I'm not mis mis mistaken, it was either by the Albion Press or, I want to say the Albion Press. It's a, it, This was just almost 30 years ago, so it's a, you know, I could be wrong on that, but I think it was Albion Press. And, um, so I read it again, and you know, and it's true. There is an agenda, and um, that book proves it to me. And just saying it's you're a conspiracy theorist, or just saying you know you're a, 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 this kind of person or that kind of person, doesn't address the fact that this um, summarizes a policy that has been realized over the last century century and a half okay. just it doesn't address that and just no no amount of name calling is going to change that i'm prepared to accept that it, it, it you know maligns jews if you want me to accept that i'll accept that but you cannot take away the fact that it outlines a plan whoever wrote this knew a that was the plan they knew it and whether they were using it to you know cause anti-semitism or whatever Okay, I'll, 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 I'll accept that that may be true, but you cannot deny the fact that this sets out a plan and agenda that we've, we've been living through. So you should read it. Okay, just a couple more to go. This book's wonderful. Al Kosheri's Epistle on Sufism. I read this a few times, or bits of it anyway. Um... It's a thousand years old, this book. And what I like about it, it's 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 basically sort of it's it's a kind of short hagiographies, it's short story stories of the saints, as it were, but some of them are very interesting and I'm sure some of them have got some truth to them. Um one of the stories that I, I like very much in this is uh, it's, they're really just narratives about particular people and you have to kind of plough through the so-and-so told so-and-so told so-and-so and I just skip all of that because I'm not interested in it but just get to the kind of like the nub of it and there are a couple of stories in there which I mean there are a lot of stories in there which are uplifting which are certainly edifying and challenge you to to lead a more righteous life but there are, there are a couple of stories in there that really sort of stuck with me the first is of some he was a bandit this guy he was basically a highway robber highwayman and he was engaged at night in, in climbing through the window a, a certain beautiful slave girl um to have his wicked way with her and he and a qari a, a reciter of the quran read out this verse is it not time for the hearts the, the hearts of men should return to god or something like that and he just stopped mid-action thought yeah, you know what? That's right. It is time. And he turned around. Oh, sorry. He turned around and <laughs> repented and became a righteous man, became a great scholar. It's a wonderful story. And I'm sure there is, you know, some truth to this. Um, another story from it that I really liked. I can't remember his name, but let's say it was Ahmed. It was blind Ahmed. And um, the reason why he was called blind was he married a very beautiful, very beautiful wife who some months after the marriage became had some terrible disease and became all pockmarked and not attractive at all. And in order not to offend her, he feigned blindness for the rest of his life. I just thought that was so beautiful. This... Okay. You can't really see. This is... 
bit out of focus. But the complete works of Shakespeare. And uh, Shakespeare is the cornerstone of the, of the English language. Shakespeare was, a, 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 I think, an excellent psychologist. His life was interesting. I've read theories about, you know, he didn't really write his own stuff, et cetera, et cetera. I don't believe that. I think he did write his own stuff, as far as I can see. Um, people are intimidated by Shakespeare because you do have to learn something to read it. If you just choose one play, uh, Macbeth, read Macbeth, learn to read Macbeth, just one play, don't try to read all of Shakespeare. And then maybe Hamlet. I mean, I, I hadn't read Hamlet until about a year ago, and I read Hamlet, and read it, and it's, 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 it's a kind of, it, it's a bit of a hodgepodge of philosophy, but it is a book of philosophy. If you want to speak English and really understand English, you don't have to you know, be an expert on Shakespeare, but if you don't, haven't at least read a couple of his plays and understood them, you're missing a lot. A lot of the sayings, they all come from the Bible or Shakespeare. But it's not even that good one to watch uh, or to read and then watch. We'll do both. I mean, I do both. And I'll get to the watching in a minute if I can remember. The Taming of the Shrew. <laughs> they wouldn't like that anymore, would they? No. The Taming of the Shrew. It's, it's, it'll tell you everything that you really need to know about, about women. I mean, there's an excellent um, film of it. The BBC, before it became the kind of socialist Nazi party, whatever they are now, actually used to make fantastic TV. And they made an entire series of Shakespeare. I think they did all of the plays. Well, there's the uh, the best one is the there's who is it? John Cleese. John Cleese plays. Is it Petruchio? I think it's Petruchio. It's an excellent performance. There's another one where oh, what's his name? Richard Burton. I've got Richard Burton diaries up there. I'm trying to remember his name. Richard Burton and Elizabeth Taylor play the, the lead in a Hollywood version of of the same. Both either of them are excellent. But but read it as well. Psychology, it's humour, it's philosophy, it's religion, it's it's everything in Shakespeare. So I'm not saying everyone has to read all of Shakespeare's plays. I haven't read all of Shakespeare's plays, but I've read enough. Um, I've read Twelfth Night, I've read Macbeth, I've read uh, Hamlet, I've read you know, um, I've read the one I was just talking about, <laughs> Taming, uh, not Taming of the Shrew, but I've read Taming of the Shrew as well. You know, I've read uh, The Tempest. Um, it's a key to the language, but it's it's a key to something deeper as well. So anyway, it's obviously it's not something you probably want to high on your list if you're trying to work out what the New World Order are doing and so on, but it's certainly worth reading. Now, I've got two more which I haven't read, but I'm going to explain why I have. I'm going to, I bought them. So, these two books, first one, I haven't read this. It's Beyond Freedom and Dignity by B.F. Skinner, but I'm going to read it. Um, I also read recently uh, Schwab's uh, The Great Reset. I try to read I can't read it all because it's so interminably boring, but I do read some of what the the elite produce for us because they're warning us. They're telling you, here, we're going to do this to you. Skinner was an interesting guy. I mean, he was an absolute psychopath as far as I can see, but he he developed something, worked within something called behavioralism. And what behavioralism is about, it's sort of like a precursor to, to um, ne neuroscience. It was about, basically, if you, you change something in your environment, we can, it's how you manage a herd. And so this book, I'm going to read it because I haven't read any of him. I know of him from other books, but I'm going to read this to find out you know, a little bit more about him. Again, as with, you know, Wein Kampf, is it, is it because I love Skinner? No, it's not. It's just because I go to these people to, to learn something. And lastly, um, I haven't read it, but I'm going to, Bill Gates, How to Avoid Climate Disaster. Bill Gates is a psychopathic uh, agenda person and clearly he is pushing through an agenda as part of a, of a thousand points of light and if he produces a book I want to read it because he, they will tell you in it what they're doing so I haven't read it but I'm going to that's it 
in summary <clears throat> i could have added quite a lot of other books this is a very long video i'm sure most people won't have watched this but i have been asked so i just thought i'd sort of bash through all of these and get that out there Pl obviously not all of those books are uh, of the same quality i don't recommend them all in the same way i'm just giving you sort of spreading out smorgasbord of stuff that i've read that has sort of stayed with me and that you know if i was going to take you know 50 books with me these would probably or at least some of them would would be in there this isn't a, a book review channel it's not what i'm about but i have been asked actually by a number of people and i got quite a lot in comments and let a couple of letters and blah blah so i just thought i'd just do it now it's done and now i can get on with my with my day's work so anyway that's all for now i hope everyone is well and i i, I will try to drop another video in the next week if i can to continue with these sort of between 50 and 114 i'd like to kind of sort of chomp my way through that um but god willing so anyway that's all for now if you're listening on YouTube, you can download my full translation of the Qur'an free using the button in the top right-hand corner, or buy the hard copy there at 10% less than on Amazon. I also encourage you to sign up for the Qur'anite Plus newsletter on the site to get occasional micro-updates. You can download the audio from my YouTube videos to your mobile device using the links in the drop-down below. I recommend meetquranites.com to connect with other Qur'an alone believers. Like if you like, comment if you have something constructive to say, and subscribe to get more each week. And use the link in the drop down below to donate if you would like to help me keep doing this. And remember, this life is short, eternity is long. If you want good trees, plant good seeds. <laughs>